Welcome to FPTV and welcome to FPTV new releases uh, with the most consistent creative team in Worldwide Comics today, uh, Mr. Ed Brew Baker and Mr. Sean Phillips. Um, guys who I don't need to introduce if you've read Sleeper, Incognito, Fatal, The Fade Out, Kill or Be Killed, The Criminal Family of Books. Um, but we're here today to talk about something very specific for new releases, which is uh, hot on the heels of the, uh, the dynamite success of your Western Noir punch in the face mashup pulp. Um, you're now launching uh, an ongoing series of graphic novels in the mold of the 70s and 80s men's adventure paperbacks called Reckless. So guys, yeah. what, what can you tell us about Reckless? without spoiling um, anything? Well, it's it came about in a weird way. We, we were about to start another monthly series and then the pandemic shut everything down. Yeah. And I just, in my own sort of like panic and depression, just started reading old mystery novels and old pulp novels just to just out of fun or sort of go back, read some of the ones my dad read when I was a kid that I never read. And I liked that form so much. And I started thinking, we've never done anything like this, really. Like, we always are doing the, you know, either these sort of personal noir stories or like junkies where it's really like sort of a mystery, but really it's a, it's a character study. And, and I thought, well, we've got this break, like where we don't know what's happening with the market. And I wanted to figure out a way we could just keep moving forward. And so I just, thought, why don't we just do something like this? And I just sat down with my notebook and started jotting down ideas, like what would our version of that? Because I didn't want it to have all the same cliches as the, you know, the old, I don't want it to be all sexist and racist. Yeah, and, of course. You know, or have like a terrible ending because nobody cares because people yeah. only read the first 50 pages and, you know. <laughs> so, um, it, but it really felt like a chance for us uh, you know, I, my own personal jealousy of uh, what Darwin did with those Parker books. When I when I saw that first Parker hardback on the stands, I just thought, oh, this is brilliant. Like, of course, a Parker novel, which is 200 pages long, can be turned into a 140-page graphic novel because half of the half of the work is you know describing what Parker's doing. And I just thought, okay, like I wanted to do something like that since I saw those. Like, what's our version of that? Like a brand new thing. Well, we always want to play with format, don't we? So, you know, it was another another way of getting the pages out there. Yeah. yeah. We couldn't, you, you know, could the monthly we were planning on doing, we didn't know when monthlies were going to start again. We couldn't stockpile 200 pages of monthly comics in, on the off chance they might come out. Yeah. yeah. So this this yeah. is a way of carrying on working, but getting, you know, and trying a different format as well. Yeah. And Sean had been probably for, the entire time we've been working together, like 20 years, wanting to do like European albums and graphic and graphic novels more instead of that monthly dead. Not that Sean, I think Sean probably drew more pages a month working on this graphic novel. I wrote it faster because of not having to break and not having to worry about, yeah, Sean's already got like more of the next book than I've ever given him in 10 or 15 years probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, ever. But it really was like, We've been looking at that format a lot and, you know, we dipped our toe in with Junkies and that was a huge hit. And then Pulp, you know, Pulp was coming out, Pulp went to the printer the day of the shutdown. So at that point, like, Sean went and drew the story I'd written a year, like six months earlier for the Parker book, the, the big uh, IDW Parker collection that's coming out that we're yeah. helping to see. I can't, so Sean I can't, was working I can't on that. that. Oh yeah, no, that's, I mean, that book's going to be fantastic. And, yeah, that was a lot of fun I mean, to do. That. Yeah, that story, that, see, as those pages were coming in was when I was having this sort of revelation of like, oh, maybe this other thing that we were going to do, let's set that aside for now and focus more, because seeing Sean drawing these characters, I just started thinking back to my jealousy of those books <laughs> when they were coming out and my jealousy of Darwin for finally figuring out how to get a, better crime writer than me to work with yeah. um but yeah I, I don't know it just all kind of came together it was like I, I shot the idea off of Sean I sent him like the first chapter which is just a four-page intro to the character and he dug it and immediately started drawing and then it was just like the idea that we were doing a series of graphic novels instead of putting them out as single issues first and then collecting them 
like what I found over the last several years is our audience was bifurcating into all these different groups, people who like the singles and then will wait for the deluxe hardback later, people who only want the trades but might buy the deluxe hardbacks. And then we started putting out these comic sized hardbacks and it seemed like that was something our entire audience liked. Yeah. Like some people, you know, cause comic people, like I'm like that too. Like I, you know, if you can see my bookshelf, most of them are stacked by height. Like I'm like a, you know, I'm a nerd, yeah. um, you know, and so comic people and retailers, like they, once they find a format that works for them, like, I feel like they, they stick to that. Like, so we talked to image about it. We went through a bunch of different plans for how to do this series actually. But the biggest revelation to me was that because Sean especially is so prolific and it makes me be more prolific. When I work with slower artists than Sean, I write slower because I, yeah. because I have the luxury of it. Whereas Sean. Yeah. I'm always nagging you. To yeah. get me more Not patience. anymore, but yeah, he used to yeah, be. But you, yeah. like, I would have, but like, now I'd you've go, acclimatized to the speed. Sean, yeah, yeah. The other day, Sean sent me an email about it. Asking me if I'd send him an email about something at which he had dreamed it, and uh, and yeah. I, I had dreams of getting emails from Sean about catching up to my how many pages I'd written. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so yeah, so we started working on this book, and just the idea of how fast Sean was, I realized with the lead time we had, because we had no idea when the market was going to open again. I thought, you know, if we're lucky, we can get this first one out by the end of this year but we'll still have enough lead time that we can get two more out over the course of the same year. Like by the time it's been a year, we'll have released three full hardback graphic novels and yep. they're twice as long as pulp and junkies. Like they're yep. not, you know, they cost a little bit more, but you're getting literally like, like the first book is 144 pages and, and pulp was 72. And, you know, and pulp was like a huge hit for us. It sold through its print run in two months, which, you know, we were, we thought that would last us a year. And because Junkies lasted, was the same print run and it lasted us a little less than a year. But uh, yeah, Pulp, I mean, we're, you know, we're having to rush out of trade paperback now because uh, we're, we're back ordering on it already. I, I um, think you, know, you yeah. guys have found a sort of luxury format that just really suits your, your kind of mutual style together. And, you know, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, you you've really first day with that look with uh, my heroes have always been junkies right and that's when i've uh, and it certainly really suited really suited pulp you know wh wh and i i'm not surprised pulp has been such a big hit because i think it's the perfect confluence of storytelling from the two of you but it, it's such a beautiful format you know it's a, that that kind of the, the matte varnish covers that you've got on those they feel really special and that's on top of the yeah story and we great. actually just to talk about print nerd stuff for a second, we actually, I let Sean make the final decision because it was costly, but the paper on, uh, on, on Reckless is actually even heavier than the paper on Pulp. It is the nicest oh, wow. interior Good. paper we've ever, yeah, the only sample that the printer could send me of a book uh, using the paper was like a, a, um, a cookbook. Which yeah. is a like cookbook for like <laughs> on the thickest paper. You can yeah. t tear a page out of this book and slice someone's throat with it, probably. <laughs> Why does my mind always go there? I always, whenever I get a big book, I'm like, I could murder someone with this. Mate, you, you should um, write crime books. That's the that's the key. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's one of the things you know that's great about being with Image that we can we can do those things. We can we get total control over, you know, what format we print in, what what paperweight, you know, matte covers, whatever we want to do, you know. It's great, you know. Why not? And because we both can manage to do enough work to fill a book, why not put it out as a book? You know? Right on. I mean, uh, and that's such a beautiful place to be in to be able to do that. That must that must feel great. Yeah, but it's taken us years to get here. Of uh, course, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it. Well, it was like a slow progression. I, I now I suspect we could have gotten here sooner, but it's like we we've never tried an original graphic novel until two years ago, and then I saw like that sold more like the first issue of a comic for us you know and i was like oh okay like so we sold a lot more because people had there was a lot of people who maybe wouldn't have picked it up because they would have read it in single issues and they would have been like well i already read that so i and i found though that a lot of our a lot of our readers are you know they're they're collectors too they want that special nice version and it used to drive me crazy because i thought well you're waiting five years for the deluxe hardback and then i thought 
well, let's just give it to him first because it seems like that's all who's reading our books now are the yeah. the people who want the whole thing and and also and that's how you know, that's how general publishing works. The hardcover comes out first, doesn't it? And the cheap paperback yeah. comes out later. So yeah. Yeah. Why not the comics too? I, I, I think, yeah, inverting that traditional comics approach has worked really well. I think you've hit the nail on the edge, and that, that, that is absolutely the key to it. You know, if you're a Spence fan or, or whatever, you're going to be used to yeah. that Putnam's hardback before you actually get your, your, your mass market edition. I think, that's, I think that is totally right, particularly with the kind of following that you guys have got, because I know, say, for example, with the, uh, with the hardcover collection of, um, of Bad Weekend, I mean, I, I yeah. read that. I read that sequentially, and then yeah. you know, I as soon as it was collected, I know you added a few pages to the book, which is great. But you yeah. know, I, I I was straight at the you know the front of the queue to get hold of that as well. And I think you know your fans particularly are women and men who are just double dipping. Yeah, I and I don't want them to have to, you know. Like I I, th I feel like we can get more readers too because each of our books that we put out seems to do better than the previous thing that we've done. So, like, especially when we do a new thing, like more people are, people are always more excited about what's new. But when I first started doing, like the first time Sean and I ever worked together at all was him inking Michael Lark on Scene of the Crime, which, you know, was, a, was me trying to sort of do a, do a mystery series. And, you know, back then there wasn't really a market for it at all. But I, I was, you know, because we're putting that back in print and Sean sent me like a new cover for it. And I was like, oh yeah. This is like 20 years ago. I was 21 years ago. I was trying to do the same thing, but but now we actually can make the book, you know, and just put it out and get it right to people. And I remember back then, 20 years ago, being at conventions and people coming up to me and saying, "I love this book because I gave it to my grandmother, or I gave it to my dad because he hates that I read comics, so I gave him this mystery." And I saw someone on when we first announced Reckless, there was like an editor somewhere who said. It looked like Brubaker and Phillips had finally figured out how to crack the holiday gift for your father uh, mystery book for a graphic yeah, novel. Yeah, fing fingers crossed. Yeah. My own yeah, fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. All those people who are mad that Lee Child is quitting Reacher. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> replaced by his brother. It's like, we'll get your dad this book for Christmas. But it is really, it's like we're putting it out a couple weeks before Christmas. It's this big, nice you know, thick hardback, it's, you know, on this beautiful paper with, I think, yeah. you know, my favorite cover Sean's done in our entire career, probably. Oh, and, uh, yeah, yeah nice. I could have just jump in on that. <laughs> I, I, so I, I think I was saying to one of the emails we exchanged before this, before this chat, um, I love that cover, mate. I think, I think it's fucking fantastic. I mean, to me, it just reeks of, you know, the 1970s spinner rack and, and for me, I used to, when I was a kid in Liverpool, I used to go to Lewis's, which is a massive department store in the centre of town. And they had a book section, which was all that men's men's adventure, men's fiction stuff. Yeah. And and oh, well, yeah. Yeah, the stuff that when I was 10, I wasn't allowed to buy, but I desperately wanted to buy, right? But your, yeah. your, your <laughs> cover, your cover. All those it's, worded it's, covers. Oh, man, <laughs> on the descriptions. Remo Williams yeah. is a, is programmed as a human death machine, all that kind of stuff. I was desperate to buy it, and they wouldn't serve me those books. Right? But but yeah, I similarly, to to Piggly Wiggly, and they had a spinner yeah. rack of all those. Yes, and a yeah. Day and places like that, they were just everywhere, and uh, that was part of the definitely part of the inspiration for doing the three a year too, because I was reading about when um, John D. McDonald launched Travis McGee. They put them out like the first three books came out two months apart each. So over six months. I'm not that fast. They, don't do that. Uh, yeah. No, Sean can't draw. I, I, I can't, I'm not that fast either. I don't understand how he did that. <laughs> but I just thought, okay, that's how you, you know, the the biggest thing I've I've found because it's comics as opposed to graphic novels or as opposed to traditional book publishing, as I have to keep explaining to people, each of these books is its own graphic novel. Book two isn't like picking up oh, where book yeah, one left yeah. up. It's not a, there's no cliffhanger. Yeah. You get a whole story, and then book two actually takes place, I think, four years after book one. And it's yeah. just, this is the next story we're telling with this character. Yeah. But yeah, We've always had that it's, since Criminal, trying to explain to people that Criminal are all self-contained books, and you don't yeah. need to read them in, in any order. You know, they're constantly telling yeah. people that. But yeah. I, 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 I mean, I think it's something you've really that. succeeded with. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, really worked, it's really worked well in the criminal universe. And this seems to me just to be a natural evolution of that. Yeah. 
Well, that's what we found is when we don't like with junkies, like junkies is a criminal book, but we didn't put criminal on the cover. It doesn't say until, until you get to the title page, it says a criminal novella. Then you're like, oh, what's criminal if you haven't read criminal before, but it doesn't matter. You're just reading the story about this girl. And if you've read criminal, there's this extra layer of like, oh, this is reflecting back to the first criminal book. But, um, but if we put criminal on the cover, it would have been considered by a lot of people criminal book eight. And if they hadn't read the first seven, they might not have picked it up. Whereas I went on a, on a little book tour in America when that book came out. And what I found was we had a whole different audience than I thought we did. There were young girls in line, like reading the book and crying. And I was like, what the hell? Where did all these people come from? Because I hadn't done like bookstore signings at outside of comic conventions for like a decade, probably regularly. And I thought, oh, there's this whole new audience that came into our work with Kill or Be Killed, which is much more aimed at that sort of young, angry Gen Z audience, you know, um, which my own, fueled by my own anger at the world, obviously. Um, but yeah, so this was, a, this is sort of like, like I, I try to pitch the book to people. I say like, do you want to have some, do you want to read something that's actually fun, but that still feels like stuff that what we do? <laughs> you know, like yeah. there's definitely some fun in it. It's definitely like a, like a, you, I mean, you've read the first almost half of it. I think, yes, right? I have. I, definitely I'm, like different than what we do in some ways, but I still feel, I feel like it still feels like our stuff, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my own sort of inter internal description of it really, uh, and I'm not saying this is accurate, this is just how it, it struck me was it's kind of like Travis McGee in a blender with with Parker in the kind of sun blown out LA with a, a <laughs> tiny hint of the equalizer and a kind of that 70s, <laughs> 80s men's paperback vibe. Yes, yeah, shot yeah. through your, shot through your kind of Phillips Brubaker prism. That's how it felt to me. And uh if, yeah, there's that makes sense. Pieces of, yeah. There's bits and pieces of all that, so especially in the first one. It was it was like putting down the list of like what makes a good series character. It's like, well, they need a they need an HQ. Yeah. You know? So it's like, oh well he, he <laughs> operates out of the movie theater. Oh, he needs that's, a cool vehicle. Yeah. He needs a cool vehicle. So he's got a really old cool van, which is like that's not typical. Like all these things. But definitely it's interesting because uh like I was reading some of the Travis McGee novels again and just shocked because I hadn't read them in years and shocked at how horrifyingly sexist they are. Oh man, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so odd. Uh, it's, it's true. It's still ahead of the curve on the environment. It's like the yeah. most pro-environment books because it's starting in the 60s, he's like very pro-like environment and how we're ruining the world. And yet every time he meets a woman, it's like, he, I mean, one of the books I was reading, he didn't want to take the job because the woman wasn't sexually appealing enough. I just thought, <laughs> oh my God. Like, I want to attack this genre yeah. and not do all of that. Like, yeah. I want to attack that genre in the same way that we did something like Sleeper, which went into superheroes and sort of flipped it over the other way, you know, or Incognito. And I just thought, okay, well, how can I do that and make it ours and make it fun and make it fun to work on? Because sitting in the pandemic and watching my country burn down at the same time, uh, you know, really the, the other book that we were going to do was sort of about how do you survive fascism? And yeah. I had just done Pulp, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I didn't realize was going to be so relevant when it got released. <laughs> but, um, but I just thought, I don't want to write that. Like it would be so, because I wake up every day and I have to read the news and then sit down to work. And it's like, I want to work on something that's fun. And this was, you know, I was, I get up every day, like excited to work on this series. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm me too, yeah. I mean, it has, you know, it's been fun to draw. It's, it's like Ed said before, we've got a real rhythm on this that we don't get on a monthly comic where, you know, cause every month, on a monthly comic, every month I have to stop a couple of days and do the cover and the design pages and put it all together and send it to the printers. And we haven't had to do that for six months. We can just get on and just totally inhabit this world and just, and just do it. Yeah, well, it's well, really, that, it's which really must be a joy. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, for me, what it's been interesting because I break the book in. You know, I mean, you saw it, it's broken down into chapters like a regular novel, and that was such a revelation to me to not have to. Um, oh, this is my internet connection. Oh, I guess it's okay now. Um, but that was a revelation to me, structure-wise, of how to put the book together. I just thought, oh, okay. And then I found myself, because when I'm writing scripts for the 
like criminal, like when we were doing cruel summer, like every chapter of that is 24 to 30 pages long. And it's basically each one is a sort of self-contained short story that adds together. And you finish that, you don't immediately start writing the next one. You walk around for like five days trying to figure out, okay, what is the next one? How does it, how does it work? What's the structure of it? How is it different than what? Whereas this is just, you know, we're just telling a novel straight through. And I just, I felt reinvigorated while doing it. I feel like we were flying by the seat of our pants, but every day I would get pages from Sean and just be so excited to just keep moving forward. And, you know, honestly, I think it's, I, I don't, I don't understand how it's possible that Sean's been doing comics this long and continues to get better. Whereas, you know. Sheer like, talent. <laughs> <laughs> Sheer yeah. talent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's true. That, that does count for a lot. And it is absolutely true. It's kind of a pleasure to watch you work over this like 20 year period. Uh, and, and I think what you've, what you the, the half of the book that I've seen, I mean, to me, somebody who grew up reading that, that, that genre and was a big fan of it, to see your artistry attached to, you know, remixing that stuff, that DNA from, mm. from all those covers and those visuals. It was a glorious thing. I, the other thing, when you were talking about, um, you wanted him to have a cool location and, uh, you know, like the movie theater and, and a cool ride. That seemed to me that the, the beauty of that is that's a very kind of visual layer onto one of these characters that you don't so much always find in the original books, but you nearly yeah. always find if they get adapted into, say, television or whatnot. Yeah. So it's like in the TV show, Spencer has a cool car and he lives in a firehouse, right? Okay, even though that show's not particularly good. And it's like with yeah. Rockford, you know, he, he's got the cool car yeah. and he lives in the trailer, yeah? And yeah. that's when I read that, I thought, oh man, that's what you guys are doing. Uh, but you're also hot wiring in the fact that this, this literary genre is so keyed into noir movies or those... 70s gritties crime thrillers which are clearly such a big influence on you guys we've been working together for so long at this point that i don't know about you know i mean we never talk about it we never talk about anything but work but <laughs> but, uh, but we've been working together for so long that i i feel like we're a unit you know like when people whenever like i almost get angry when i see articles saying we're reteaming for a new thing i'm like when did we break up that's like saying the beatles yeah, are getting back together yeah. for the next <laughs> album like yeah until the Beatles break up, they're not getting back together. <laughs> so, but I'm always like, we are, I, I think, unique in comics in that way, and that we have stayed together as a team and just continued to put out books regularly. There are, you know, I, I mean, my, our inspirations were, you know, like Munoz and Tempio and people like that who yeah. just, you know, did these amazing European graphic albums. Yeah. And we always, like, wanted to sort of be like that, I think. And so I think the way that Sean and I work together now like, I find myself sometimes having to go, oh, wait, have I put too much text here? Do I need to take things out and let Sean tell the story more? I mean, I think there's a lot more dialogue scenes in Reckless than there are probably even in, like, something like Cool Summer or Vault. Yeah, because but they've got, they've got the working. space, haven't they? Because we've got the page yeah. count, we can do, yeah. we can, you know, you can have a 10-page conversation. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't, you don't need to suddenly get a cliffhanger because you're getting near the end of an issue. You know, we, we can yeah. release it differently. Can I ask you guys about something that always strikes me about your work is that one of the things I find is uh, super memorable about it. And uh, I was talking to my son, Joe, about this the other day because he, he read Pulp and uh, he went very quiet for a little bit. Or we were both hanging out in the house doing something. I was like, hey, man, are you OK? And he was like, I was just really fucking absorbed by this, you know, and he throws down <laughs> Pulp, which he's just gone through. But what we were talking about is the fact that um, your, your dialogue and your facial characterization always feel in such harmony to me. So I get a real sense of the characters being performed in a way that you don't often see on the comic book page. So when I hear the voice of your characters, Ed, and I see them attached to the visual you've created of that character, it feels like very much like a performance like you'd see on celluloid. I think it has a, a strength to it. It jumps off the page in that way, if that makes sense. Is that a conscious yeah. thing you guys developed? Or is, is it something that you've ever thought about? Is it part of your process? I think, you know, as far as drawing comics, I always find the acting <laughs> is the most important part of it, you know? Yeah. No matter if it's with Ed or any, you know, any other comics I might have done in the past, it's, I've, I've got to know what they're saying. Otherwise, how am I going to know what they're going to, 
how they're meant to look. You know, I need to, well, not just what they're saying, what they're thinking as well. You know, and Ed's, in the stuff that Ed gives me in the script, I get all that. I know exactly what he means. You know, like I said, we've worked together for so long, which just seems we're a unit. Yeah, I feel like like when I write for other people, it takes a while to get to the point where I write as minimally for them as I do for Sean. But I mean, Sean, will, like I spend more time like sometimes on a, on like describing a facial expression, but it'll be like not too extreme, but a little bit this. This is what he's feeling. You know, and because uh, to me, that's the most important thing. And I, I think that's one of the reasons we've continued to be a team for so long is that like, because you can write a 10 page dialogue scene and the way Sean draws it, people are drawn right through it and they don't even think about, oh, I've just read two people staying in a bar for 10 pages because he's, you're emoting to those characters. And, and compared to, I think a lot of other artists who rely on like photo reference as much, like Sean uses photo reference to, to help him do the art, but yeah. he doesn't just, you know, like a lot of that stuff ends up looking lifeless to me. And when I see Sean's pencils or, inks like I always feel like I empathize with those characters and so much of yeah. what I think comics as an art form does better than almost anything else is uh, allows you to sort of put yourself in these people's shoes and allows you to you're reading a story like Scott McCloud talked about in Understanding Comics you know 25 years ago or whatever about you know how even the most minimal lines can make you empathize with like Charlie Brown you know it's just like yeah. that one little wrinkled eyebrow is all yeah. you need sometimes to to know there's tragedy happening yeah. and Sean's just amazing at that stuff and and also like I used to worry about like well is this going to be too hard to draw but we've been working together for so long that every time I, I think that now I think well he'll draw it anyway <laughs> he'll make it, yeah. he'll make it work yeah. somehow. This, this guy can do yeah. anything that's the key you know what I mean? but you know every time I get some script it's like how the hell am I going to draw that yeah. The first time I read it, but then the second time I read it, I think, ah, oh, yeah, I know exactly how to do that. And you know, research is difficult, but it's a lot easier than it used to be. You know, before the internet, it was a hell of a lot harder to find out what things look like. Um, so I try not to worry about it. What's interesting about researching this one is because it's all specific, like LA, this one is LA in 1981, the next one is LA in 1985, and after the first one. I started like reaching out to places when I couldn't find enough reference. I'd like write to somebody like the research librarian at the Santa Monica library. I'm like, you have better pictures of the room where the microfiche was. And, and cause I'm working on this graphic novel and people, because the graphic novels are such a big deal now, people are really excited to pitch in. They want their, you know, <laughs> they want the old library to look right. And, you know, so it's been a lot of fun, but I, I love that period piece element of it so much because in comics you can anything can be said anywhere it costs sean the same amount of money to draw 1981 as it does to draw now except yeah. nobody has to be looking at a cell phone constantly i mean yeah anything outside of the uk is alien to me anyway so <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, it's difficult i mean i've never even been to la till a year ago <laughs> and now it's making me enjoy it all the time <laughs> yeah now we're doing the most california book we've ever done actually yeah. we, but at least there's literally now, two know. pages of driving directions in this book at one point <laughs> i couldn't think of a better testimonial for your achievement because uh i've spent a lot of time in la and i just assumed you had as well looking at the page because it's not just the the reference of it, it's the way it feels, you know. Oh, it feels like LA. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I think a lot of that is coming from the collar as well. That my yeah, son but your son does, does right. You know? he's, he's just done an, since you've been working with him, he's just done an amazing job, I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He's oh, really God. bringing it to life. It's unbelievable. When he came out to LA with me last year, we went to see Ed and we did a, a festival and stuff. And he took Jake shot loads of Super 8 movie oh, stuff. Lovely. So that, that has got that vintage washed out look about it so maybe it's taking yeah. a lot of influence on that yeah i sent him a bunch of pictures of uh like stills from movies or tv show things that just really looked like la to me because i always assume yeah. everyone from england thinks all of california is just either brown and dry or on fire yeah it's not it's not hobbiton for sure yeah. unfortunately um but i like I sent him stuff like uh, Terrence Malick stills and stuff, and I just thought, this is what California feels like, especially in the early 80s era. Like, I really wanted to just, you know, but yeah, he's, he's, he just blew us away with this book, I think. This is the best yep. color. Oh, yeah. Um, he, and on a pretty tight deadline, too, because, you know. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> no, he finished within he finished within five hours of the deadline for this book. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And the last page is one of my favorites. <laughs> what can you both tell us about the character of uh, Reckless himself? Um, well, yeah. Ethan, without, I don't want to spoil, there's a couple twists that come in his story early on, but he's a character that I started thinking about probably like five years ago or so. I started thinking of an idea of a of a sort of detective, but sort of a repo man and sort of a troublemaker, not really a, like a, like I like the non-legal detectives, like Lawrence Block wrote. Uh, oh man, book. yeah, the Matt Scudder series, right? Yeah. Yeah, Matt Scudder who only works for the bad guys after a while, yeah. you know, it's like yeah. if a criminal needs a crime solved, they hire this guy because he doesn't pay taxes. Yeah. So I started jotting down a lot of notes about that, but one of the things I've never really been able to find a way to do in any of my work is talk about my childhood as a Navy brat, like growing up around the world and not really being able to ever feel like an insider anywhere because my family, when I was very young, when I was born, my dad was in Vietnam actually because he was in Naval Intelligence. And so I didn't meet my dad, I think, until I was two or something. And wow. then we moved uh, to Virginia for a few years to be near uh, like the CIA, NSA, like all that stuff and then we moved to Cuba for three years and then we moved to San Diego. We always really like spent my whole childhood just kind of like moving which a huge portion of American families are military families and that's their life and I feel like like all of these detective characters have like a city that's their place. There's never like other than Jack Reacher who is you know is like the guy who got out of the, who got out of the military and is just roaming around I hadn't seen anything really that reflected that sort of Navy brat experience that I'd had. And I really wanted to write about a character who grew up with that kind of lifestyle. But I also thought I wanted this book to be set in the 80s because I wanted to use this moment to, to tell these stories as a way to also like write these exciting, fun stories, but that are also sort of looking back at the past and, and like the way we were viewing the world then as opposed to the way we view it now and how even in 1981, in some ways, the world still felt kind of doomed, like especially when I was a teenage punk yeah. rocker in San Diego, like and Reagan was president, we were just, no, oh, we're fucked, we're doomed. And, you know, we had no idea what we were in for, really. Um, you know, I'd kill to have Reagan back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but, yeah, I wanted to be able to, to address like some social stuff that I'd grown up aware of because my, because of growing up in a military family and growing like my, my uncle who I'm named after was uh, high up in the CIA and my dad was high up in Navy intelligence. And so I'd been around that world. So I wanted to have a character who came out of that world. So the idea of tying him back to the late sixties, early seventies, like revolutionary you know, movement. I, I like that a lot because it's like as someone who grew up in this kind of hardcore right wing military family, I, of course, you know, didn't grow up as a hardcore right winger. Um, you know, I grew up listening to British punk rock and, you know, and uh, like, like all the best people do, mate. Yeah. And, and deciding that, you know, and George Carlin albums and deciding, uh, yeah. oh, damn. And so I wanted to, to make Ethan that kind of a character who really is like the sort of prototypical outsider. And, uh, you know, the last few years I've been living in a beach town in California and um, up north, north, north of uh, L.A. And so I've been out in the water a lot, like boogie boarding and, and, you know, trying to learn to surf and stuff to the point where I almost drowned last year doing it. And uh, but I've. But I really got attached to the sort of surfing lifestyle of it all and, and really thought surfers are outsiders, you know, in a weird way. And so it really made sense to me. I wanted to do something that really felt like California, you know, but also that, that felt like a guy with my background being in California because I roam around like I've spent my life as an adult roaming up and down the West Coast, basically like I. If I'm somewhere for too long, apparently, I just start to feel weird about it and need to move because that's what my childhood was. So I love the idea of doing a series about someone like that, drop them down in Venice Beach, you know, in the 80s. He's, you know, in the classic Dogtown era surfing. You know, I, I, I didn't have him be a skateboarder because it's, 
he's 30 something years old. Yeah, yeah right. It's embarrassing <laughs> in 1981. Yeah, that's not nowadays right. you got 80 year old surf, like surfers <laughs> and skateboarders, and it's fine. But um, but I just thought, you know, he's a surfer, he's an outsider, he's a guy who comes from that kind of background like I did. But he views, but he views the world in a in a way that's different from a lot of those detective characters. I think he's and you know, but he's also kind of damaged from everything he's gone through. I don't want to get too into that, but he's kind of damaged from everything he's gone through. So he's willing to do things that a lot of other people aren't willing to do. Certainly, nothing I would be willing to do. I I like to think of these things and think, well, oh, it'd be great if someone would go do that. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, oh, he's kind of like my living vicariously. So he's like a, you know just that kind of outsider troublemaker character. And a lot of people were saying it's a PI comic or it's a PI graphic novel. And I thought in some ways it is, but I would refer to PI as like the third description of him. Yeah. You know, for, for my, he's a surfer, he's a troublemaker and he will solve your problems for you. Yeah. I mean, that, that's where the, uh, that's where the, the Scudder analogy comes in, which I think is, that's much more in keeping with the thing with, with what you've done. And I think um, that's it's what I was saying. Like, if Parker was a good guy, and yeah, he knew, he knew anything yeah. about his history, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or what I his think, real name was. <laughs> I think I think that is a great description, and, and, and it's interesting because even the name you've chosen, even though you've given him a first name, it, yeah. it, 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 he's one of those characters that yeah, you undoubtedly start to think of by his surname in the same way that it works with Parker. Even though you don't know Parker's name, you don't know Spencer's name. Reckless is a name that you just kind of grab hold of. I assume that was deliberate. Oh yeah, I had the last name for a year before I could finalize the first name, before it, before it became Ethan Reckless. I It was so many different names before then. I just could, I hated them all. Like I could not find a name that just felt like the right one. And then one day I just wrote down Ethan Reckless and I just thought, that's it. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, Reckless was uh, was a last name that I, I saw an article somewhere where someone's last name was Reckless and I just thought, no way. And I just wrote it down. <laughs> okay, yeah. perfect. But I do want to stress too, uh, the because like, again, because it's comics, like when uh, the next book comes out in April and the next book is called Friend of the Devil, a Reckless book. It's not Reckless Volume 2 with like a little, like it has the same cover design and everything. I, I wish, is there a way to share images on this? Yeah. I could hold, the book, I could hold a picture up. Oh yeah, hold yeah. the picture of the cover up. For, oh, that'd for, be awesome. Yeah, it's going oh, that look, book, oh yeah. mate, it's another great job, man. That looks fantastic. This is my sketchbook, Ed. Yeah. I get a sketchbook made, I get a sketchbook made of every, I get a sketchbook made of every thing to do with thumbnails in, so. Oh, wow. Well, that's, oh, that's fascinating. Well, <laughs> <laughs> or really? to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the next one is mid 80s uh, satanic panic, skinheads, actresses in Hollywood, all of it colliding. It's uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that looks great. That looks great. But yeah, this one is really, this one is really, it's the origin book in a way. Like you've read, you know, you've read the first half, so you know a lot about Ethan Reckless at this yeah. point. And it's really, it's sort of, I felt like I, it was great because, you know, we can get into the story a little quicker in the next ones, I think, because it takes half the book for us to understand and care about him enough to, to then want to follow him on, on, you know, what is now going to be his sort of violent quest in the, the second half of the book. And um, so this one was really like, you know, what do you do when you're 32 and your girlfriend from when you were 19 calls you up and needs help, you know, yeah. and it's like, oh, but she's yeah. a fugitive on the run, yeah. you know, and it's like, oh, that's an interesting mystery to me that I've never seen. So I just thought it allowed me to tell us everything we need to know about him, talk about periods of America that a lot of us have forgotten. Like kids today grow up and they don't know what Watergate, you know, let alone the Chicago 8 or pro or any of the stuff that was going on back in the 60s and 70s that I grew up knowing about, you know? So I, I really feel like this book is, uh, is a book, it's, it's about the past, but it's about now, you know? Like everything that when you write about the past, like Pulp is about now, turned out to be more about now than any of us ever had any idea when we started working on it. <laughs> 
I, but, I, th- I mean, you know, I think that's one of the great things about pulp, and uh, I think I think that echoing, you know, of contemporary concern, you know, in, in your work, and and in, that's a, a very powerful element of what you guys have managed to achieve. Yeah, I I like writing about the past, especially crime fiction is more is more fun to do in the past because cell phones take so much drama and tension out of things. Like if you're watching The X-Files from 1993, anytime Mulder and Scully split up, it's tense. Yeah, right. Watch it from last year, they split up, they're on the phone constantly. You know, it's like everybody's on the phone constantly. People can know instantly where everything is. Like we have a scene in the second book where Ethan has to spend multiple days in a library looking through microfiche. Like imagine doing that now. (laughs) Imagine having to draw that. Yeah. Yeah. There's photo reference, um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to do that. It, I feel like it it allows us to sort of do something else with this kind of series character that I also hadn't seen done was because the book start the first book starts in 1981. With each book, you get to see him successively get older, and you get to see the times around him change. So I get to write about the world I lived through as I was growing up because I was. 13 in 1981. You know, so so was, you, you've hit upon a, a, absolutely a question I was going to ask, which is, uh, are you planning to age him up as the series goes on? So, so oh, yeah. I think yeah, that's yeah, such yeah. a great thing. 1985, all the characters will, you know, like Anna, his assistant, we'll get to see her. She's more of a mod sort of looking girl in the second book instead of a punk girl because it's 1985. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun for me because I get to sort of dwell on my own history a little bit, but also you can see the path to where we are now, starting back then. You know, like I can look at look at my whole life and I see where we are now, and I see all the steps that were taken to get us there. So it's it's kind of interesting, and yet at the same time, I think you know, here we are just sort of doing this really fun, you know, thriller series too. <laughs> I, I think I think that duality is fascinating, and something I want to ask both of you guys about is um, how does it feel to uh, when you look back on the career that you've had together as a working partnership to have essentially produced all these uh, all these highly critically acclaimed best-selling series which have, which have become more and more popular as you've gone on um, within the crime noir genre, which has basically been uh, criminally either underserviced or or poorly implemented traditionally in comics. And you know, when you look back, there's a handful of crime comics over the last 40, 50 years. And every time, say, DC put out an issue of Showcase with Don, Johnny Double or had a few Jason Bard backups in Detective, that's pretty much it. Eight years ago, it seemed like there was this big boom of crime comics. And at the time I thought, oh, this is great. More crime comics are coming out. And then I started thinking, well, wait a second, where are the crime people <laughs> in comics? But, um, but I, I was like sort of welcoming, you know, like, let's have more, let's have this be a bigger genre. And cause you know, comics grew out of Pulp Fiction, which, you know, is where, you know, Hammett and Chandler debuted and, and Kraft and all these, you know, all these horror and, and crime writers and horror does pretty well in comics. But what I consistently hear from, from a lot of retailers is that our crime books sell really well for them, but it's much harder for them to sell anyone else's. And I feel like, well, we're the lucky ones in that way. But yet at the same time, I feel like outside of like a lot, most of my friends that I know in that are in America are writers or artists. And a lot of them are crime writers and People who write crime fiction are well aware of what Sean and I do and buy our books, but the general crime fiction audience outside of comic stores, I still feel like a lot of those people are still sort of unaware of what we do. Actually, like I, that's one of the one of the things I'm really trying to target with uh, with Reckless because I feel like our, a, a lot of our book I feel like is just aimed at a general audience and comic people like it because they know us because we launched Criminal. Right yeah. after I killed Captain America and Sean yeah. blew Marvel zombies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like that was. We've always, that was we've always aimed for that. Since Criminal started, we've always looked outside of the comic market. We want to attract people that read general crime fiction or, or watch crime movies or TV shows and stuff. You know, it's, it's just really hard. It takes a long time. Yeah, I, I, th- I think build up a big backlog, and now yeah. our, our 
our stuff is about, you know, half the comic market and half the book market, but you wonder how much of that book market is really just online sales. But then I, you know, I've started hearing more and more from like bookstores that have started carrying our stuff and do really well with it. There's a bookstore in LA that uh, the uh, years ago I went there and didn't have any of our stuff and I was really dejected. And then I met the guy who runs the graphic novel section at Comic-Con last year. And he said our, the fade out was their number one selling graphic novel for like several years. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Here. That, like, that's a great part. book, by the way, guys. The fade out is phenomenal. Thank you. Really Thanks. good. So good. I mean, I, I was in, I was in, I was in, I was in Romans last year and they had a yeah. whole, they had a whole section of your books, you know, kind of like. Yeah, that's the one I was talking about. Yeah, they used right. to not talk us at all. Yeah. But then the new guy came in. So it's always like, it's like with Hollywood, like 20 years ago when I would go down to Hollywood for meetings, everyone's assistant knew who knew, knew about comics. Now all those people are running studios. So it's like that generation, had, that generation of change and, so, and, and I feel like with the bookstore market too, you know, I mean, well, what is the bookstore market right now with everything, you know, shut down and mail order, but, but I feel like the bookstore market has come around so much more on graphic novels because of the young adult stuff, you know, and because of the big, you know, the times where DC has had like a big hit with like Watchmen or V for Vendetta or, you know, times where they have like a perfect book to sell around their movie, um, which, you know, that's great if you can do that. <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I i think that's right let me ask you uh, a couple of final quick shot questions so um we've touched upon some of them in the course of these conversations um so men's adventure men's action paperbacks what were your favorite series from among those well i've never read any so you know I... <laughs> when i was when i was a kid and the department stores had you know their trashy novels it was all kung fu, kung fu novels. The ah, Western right. Kung fu yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. Uh, like Sloan and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, Did you ever read uh, King Kung Fu? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, Kai. Yeah, King, yeah. Kai. Kai Kung Fu. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a batshit crazy series. I, 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 I still remember it now because there was yeah. heavy drug influence, heavy, you know, kaleidoscopic phantasmagoric vibe those were sort of, those were sort of books that got passed around school because there'd been like one very short sex scene in it or one yeah. really <laughs> gross, <laughs> or one really gross bit of violence and you know, the all yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean i've reread quite a lot of that stuff recently um i was in the pub a few years ago with Ian rankin and he read all that stuff too so we were like reminiscing about those trashy books that we both read when we were kids and I, a friend another friend of mine sent me one again and then I, re I read it and I sent it on to Ian and he was like, oh God, I can't remember, you know, just brings it all back over, you know. It was an absolutely terrible book. Yeah. But, you, know, it, you know, it had I something about it. Written written in, in, most of them were probably written in a week or two. Oh, so, God, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. The, the, the ones I remember buying as a kid at the Pick and Save, I got a couple of uh, Executioner series. Like Don Pendleton, like, yeah. The Don Pendleton ones. I guess he kind of invented that genre. Yeah, the Punisher yeah. is kind of a the Punisher. Just, real the Punisher is just a direct ripoff of the of the <laughs> Executioner, just with a skull on his chest. You know, just literally. Yeah, um, no, literally. Yeah. Yeah, I I read some of those. I read some of the Remo Williams. I read oh, one yeah. called The Penetrator, which oh is yeah, quite a risque name. But they had cool covers, the covers, you know. Right? Like I would buy them on the cover. Yeah, I sent Sean a couple of the covers from the Penetrator. <laughs> now, I, now, I love the fact that you've answered the question this way because that's a question that I had for you because the composition on the Penetrator covers, which were written by a pseudo, written by two authors, both writing under the uh, the name Mark Hardin, right? Oh, like, no, Mark that. Hardin's yeah. character. It's Lionel Derrick is yeah. the author, but. Uh, I I I, re I only realized found this out recently. Apparently, it's two guys who use that pseudonym, and the way they worked is not like with uh, with Superior Murphy on the Destroyer, where they co-wrote. These guys like literally wrote alternating books, which is oh, I wow. thought it was a fascinating way to do. It. But the DNA of your reckless cover feels very much to me like you know the, there's a bit of a penetrator nod in the the way some of those penetrator covers are, uh, they put the yeah. composition together. Yeah, I mean, it's partly that, and it's partly the. F uh, I've been doing loads of DVD covers over the last couple of years for like trashy seventies movies, and it's that sort of like film poster montage type stuff which works so well as well. And you, you know, could do just like, um, those three, uh, those three 
covers for the new criminal deluxe editions too, which were these yeah, big it's the same sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got that sort of um, that that same sort of vibe. But part it of that actually that's tricked it's Sean it's into doing this second this cover uh, because uh, it turned out I didn't I didn't mean to trick him, but we were originally going to do a different thing, and so Sean Sean's first thing that he did for Reckless was a a, a cover that's just it's just Ethan walking towards us carrying an axe and there's a fire yeah, explosion behind him yeah big explosion yeah. behind him and uh and then when we were getting further into the book I thought well we need another cover that's more like a throwback to that kind of era and he did and he did this he should sent the sketch for that and I just thought oh well this has got to be the actual cover because this yeah. is the best thing I've ever seen and uh and then he and then he nailed it on the painting too and I just thought and then the second one I like you know just as much if not better so it's yeah. uh yeah now he's set the bar really high for himself but yeah that that was yeah. the funny thing. like i really wanted it to feel like uh like like it had that feel of something from that cd era and then but it's a hardback book and you open it up and it's this beautiful art <laughs> it's like oh wait this guy isn't this kind of some sleazy you know because <laughs> like, that's the problem with those books when i would try to read them even as a child i remember thinking these are not good and i remember like going over to my dad's yeah, like yeah. shelf and pulling down like a Raymond Chandler book that had like a or a, or like one of the Spencer for hires yeah. or one of the Spencer novels and, that had like a lurid painted cover and started reading that and I thought oh well this is more interesting it's more of a mystery but that was my my goal with this in the back of my head I thought if Ross McDonald and John D McDonald ever you know had a kid this kid would be writing this book <laughs> you know <laughs> because I like the structure. And I mean, so much of what Jack Reacher, you know, in those books are is just, you know, I mean, all the all the new editions of Travis McGee have an intro by the child, but it's so obvious when you go back and you read it, you're like, oh yeah, he's doing like, what if Travis McGee now, you know, in a different person, but that same kind of, that guy who gets into trouble and then you want to see how he gets out of it. Like I, like mystery novels aren't necessarily that, like the good mystery novels are really you're following a detective and the story is about everybody else and the detective is kind of almost the invisible man in the book. Like I love Ross McDonald, but I didn't want to just do that kind of a straight PI thing. I wanted to do because it's comics too. And like you said, it's like in the book version of this, whoever wrote the book might have not thought, well, oh, I'll have him be in a movie theater, but I'm doing the comic book version. So it's like, Oh well, let's have him be in a movie theater because that's the coolest thing in the world to have your own yeah. movie theater. Yeah, we might have some cool things to draw. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And, and, and also, <laughs> another way. Yeah, I mean, it's a visual medium. Why not? Yeah, yeah. And Sean, it's a nod to your, you know, it's a nod to your movie DNA that you're just talking about. You know, it's a, yeah. it seems to me it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful connection. And I think that's very interesting that in all of the great PI novels, the central character, the PI, PI himself. The Continental Ops is a great example of this. It's really quite yeah. anonymous, you know. And, yeah, um, never even named. Yeah, no, right, exactly. And yeah. and the outliers, you know, like your your Matt Scudders or your Spencers, were were uh, it's it's more about them and their personal take on things. Um, yeah, they're really not so common, you know. So I think it's uh, particularly for a visual medium, you know, the uh, the anonymous here it doesn't really work in the same way. And I think, uh, yeah. you know, you you've delivered. Yeah, I mean, it can, that can work in a, that can work in a film because you've got an actor yeah. that brings yeah. a lot of baggage with them. Yes. Whereas in, in a comic book, it's very hard to get any depth into the characters visually, or you know, um, and with a limited amount of words and stuff, you know. It's, it's much it's much harder so you know we've constantly we've always all of our stuff has been character driven i think rather than plot driven hasn't it ed yeah yeah i mean the, I plots, the plots are there but the characters are the important thing and they drive the plot yeah and, so, and you know we're, we're much more interested in what goes on in their heads yeah yeah, yeah it's always about that. making you care about the people yeah because yeah. Then you want no matter how horrible they are yeah, yeah. Huh? I, I, how no matter how are, horrible how horrible they are, they are. Well, how horrible <laughs> I swear there were people who fell in love with Teague Wallace by the end of Cruel Summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, think, I mean, I, I, think that's I true. quite liked it by the end, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that is a great note to wind up on, guys. And um, uh, so we have been discussing um, Ed and Sean's uh, ongoing, new ongoing series of graphic novels, Reckless, which you can order from the links attached to this interview. Uh, I've been lucky enough to read half of the first book and it's fantastic. It's a beautiful package, beautifully drawn, beautifully written, that you're really going to enjoy. And oh, guys, and I want to say, 
Because yeah, it's yeah. the exact same size as pulp. Uh, it's twice as thick, but it's yeah. the same format. It's, it's comic size, size yeah. Size. Yeah. It's not oh. oversized. We've been getting resistance to the oversized books lately. Oh, okay. So, so well, this uh, pulp is a very nice, manageable, manageable yeah. size, and pulp with a bit more depth. That's a beautiful yeah. size for your bag, yeah. or you know, traveling on transport, reading anywhere. Eminently we'll transportable. Next to the other books. Right on, exactly. <laughs> next to your complete collection of Brubaker and Phillips. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have been watching um, Forbidden Stop. Planet TV with Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. Guys, thank you very much for um, carving out an hour to chat with us. It's been awesome. Oh, absolutely. That's okay. Thanks for having thank us. You. Yeah, yeah thank great you. to have you here. And we'll see you again soon. Take care of yourselves. Great. Thank thanks. You.